Lancia Delta HF Turbo, la nuova vettura della famiglia Delta. Lancia Delta HF Turbo, nata vincente. La nuova Lancia per soddisfare... La Lancia Delta è disponibile. Lancia Delta. Lancia. 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 Italians say Lancia and Brits say Lancia. This video goes out to an international audience, so I'm going to say it the way it's said by the people who founded the company, as that seems to make the most sense. I hope it doesn't offend your ears too much. It's hard to believe that the Lancia Delta was originally envisaged as an upmarket medium-sized hatchback, something to compete with BMW and Mercedes-Benz. Its legacy is anything but that. It's maybe the definitive hot hatch of the 1980s that had six World Rally Championship trophies to back it up. Lancia have tried to recreate the Delta Magic twice, but fans still talk about the original in hushed tones. Why did Lancia want to make a luxury hatchback in the first place? Why did a twist of fate catapult the Delta to become a legend in motorsport? Why is a new Delta running around rally circuits in 2023? And is a new Delta on the way? This is the Lancia Delta story. After running short on funds, Lancia was sold in 1969 to Fiat. The iconic Italian carmaker decided to invest in a new range of cars using the Greek alphabet naming system Lancia had used on cars 60 years earlier. They skipped the first letter, Alpha, naming the first car the Beta in 1972, followed by the Gamma in 1976. It didn't take a code cracker to work out what the next car would be named, with Delta being the fourth letter in the Greek alphabet. But what kind of car would it be? The Beta and Gamma had been large cars, at least in Europe, so it made sense that with the Delta, Lancia would return to smaller cars, its first since the Fulvia ended production in 1976. Fiat had the perfect car to base it on as well, the Ritmo, also known as the Strad in the UK. That car had been designed to combat the small hatchback threat from the likes of Volkswagen and Renault. Cars like the Golf were taking over, so it made sense for Lancia to build their own version. Cars got bigger from generation to generation, so it only made sense that the new Lancia Delta would be bigger than the current Golf, with a wheelbase that was actually bigger than the Volkswagen Passat. The stylist of both of these cars was Giordetto Gigiaro. Lancia's styling department had been gutted due to cost-cutting, so it made sense for him to design the new car. Work began in 1975, and he produced a shape that, like the Golf, was classically proportioned and easy on the eye. In fact, at the front, there was more than a passing resemblance between the Golf and the Delta. The stylish design sacrificed some practicality, though. The headroom was lower than both the Golf and the Ritmo. The Delta shape would be enhanced by large synthetic resin bumpers that match the colour of the bodywork, featuring a black bumper insert. It looks normal today, but at the time it was revolutionary and the first time it had been seen on a production car. Being based on the Fiat Ritmo, the Delta would use its 1.3 and 1.5 litre engine, combined with its 4 and 5 speed manual transmission. The Fiat Lancia partnership wrung an extra 10 horsepower from each engine, and with a 5 speed gearbox, it didn't sacrifice fuel economy. Those engines were peppy, but weren't worrying hot hatches like the Golf GTI. The fastest 1.5 litre model could get to 60 in just under 12 seconds. Lancia were pitching their cars as higher end than those of parent Fiat, so the Delta had to be more luxurious than the Ritmo. So inside, the Delta had a light, airy and spacious cabin with headrests on the front seats and a soft velvet material for the seats that also covered the door inserts and the roof. If you paid extra, you could upgrade it to simulated leather. The dashboard featured a logical control layout and was covered in soft foam to help reduce injuries in days before airbags. Above the rear view mirror was a digital clock, the height of luxury in the late 1970s. Lancia were one of the few car companies to invite you to actually write on your new car. Next to the digital clock, there was space to jot down the mileage at the last oil change. But one surprising thing about this luxury car was it didn't get the Ritmo's automatic gearbox. Lancia paid particular attention to removing vibrations and insulating the car from outside noise. 
Other luxury features were electric front windows, a heated driver's seat, headlamp wash wipe, a sunroof and air conditioning. The Lancia Delta launched the 1979 Frankfurt Motor Show, where it met with a warm reception from the public and press. German motor journalists even called it a golf killer, and once they got behind the wheel, their opinions only improved. The independent suspension inherited from the Fiat Beta and Gamma gave the car great handling, which went well with the lively engines. No wonder then that it was voted as Car of the Year for 1980, beating out the new Opel Cadet Vauxhall Astra. That was only the fourth time the prestigious title had been awarded to an Italian car company, and the first time for Lancia. The Italian media even suggested it could be talked about in the same breath as BMW and Mercedes, although that was a bit of a stretch. Lancia and Auto Bianchi produced 140,000 cars in 1978. With such good publicity for their new car, there were hopes yearly output would rise to over 200,000. It wasn't all positive press though, reviewers pulled the car up on its low headroom, and over time they came to discover that those early cars had decidedly mediocre build quality. This might be a car pitched as luxury, but it was being held back by Fiat components which, in 1979, weren't the last word in quality. With limited resources to build a car of their own, Lancia had developed the Delta in partnership with Saab. The Scandinavian company were understandably more interested it worked well on a cold winter day than Lancia, so the driver got a heated seat and Saab made sure that the heater pumped out enough warm air for even the chilliest day. They also helped improve the rust prevention so the Delta would withstand the yearly onslaught of salt that was fired up from icy roads. Saab also had a hand in practical elements such as a split-fold rear seat and low loading deck. All cars received headlamp wash white, which were required by Swedish motorway regulations. Saab's involvement meant the Delta would be sold as a Saab Lancia 600 in Sweden, Denmark and Norway in 1980, replacing the 20-year-old Saab 96, as Saab couldn't afford to develop their own replacement. The partnership between the Fiat Group and Saab resulted in not just the Saab Lancia 600, but also the Saab 9000 that was closely linked to the Fiat Chroma, Lancia Thema and Alfa Romeo 164. Unfortunately, there must have been something lost in translation when the Swedes told the Italians about rust prevention, as this car's ability to fend off rust wasn't anything to write home about. Sales of the Saab Lancia 600 were poor, and it was removed from Saab price lists in 1982, although it could be ordered until 1987, probably due to some existing contract between Saab and Lancia that stated the car had to be sold until then. Sales were steady, but didn't hit Lancia's rosy expectations. 100,000 cars were produced in the first two years of production. To get more life out of the Delta, Lancia introduced the Prisma in 1982, a booted version of the Delta, also styled by Giugetto Giugiaro. Sales helped Lancia's bottom line as it equaled the Delta's 100,000 sales in the first two years. It also helped fend off competitions such as Volkswagen's booted Golf, the Jetta. The Delta got a facelift in 1982 with a revised front lower spoiler. Inside there was new seat fabric, a digital trip computer, and there was finally the option of an automatic gearbox. Volkswagen had their Golf GTI, so Lancia produced the Delta GT with a 1.6 litre engine producing 103 horsepower. The 0-60 wasn't exactly GTI territory, only just breaking 10 seconds, but it looked the part with low profile tyres, well low profile for the time, and the GT badge. Lancia spoiled the introduction somewhat by teasing a faster four wheel drive turbocharged CV model that same year on their test track. Maybe it made sense for customers to wait for this 130 horsepower GTI killer to come along. Well, waiting clearly made sense. Lancia launched the turbocharged 128 horsepower Delta HF just a year later, HF standing for High Fidelity, a name that had been applied to Lancia sporting cars since the 1960s. Just in case you forgot it had a turbocharger, the words turbo were written on each side of the car and also on the turbo bar meter on the dashboard. 
finally it had more power than the Golf GTI. All this helped boost Lancia sales. It returned to the top 15 selling brands in Europe and helped the Fiat Group sell more cars in Europe than any other company. Over 200,000 Deltas were sold by 1984. The HF became the HF Turbo with additional bling and turbo badges. Lancia thought to expand the Delta range with the Celine Cabriolet concept, but this utilitarian design didn't win many fans and it never saw the light of day. Given all this success though, it might seem surprising that Lancia's had all but disappeared from British roads. In the late 1970s, beaters sold in the UK had been hit by a spate of subframe corrosion problems. Many had to be purchased back from the owners, then crushed. Resale values of Lancia's in the UK went through the floor and the brand never recovered. Lancia has a long history of winning in motorsports. They'd produced the Stratos in the mid 70s that won the World Rally Championship for three straight years. The Lancia Rally 037 won again in 1983, but the rear wheel drive car was quickly outclassed by four wheel drive competitors like the Audi Quattro. It was clear that a new car was needed and work started on what would become the Delta S4 that went on to win several events including the 1986 Monte Carlo Rally. The S4 had almost nothing in common with a road going Delta except for the grille and the windscreen, but like all Group B rally cars, 200 homologated road cars had to be manufactured. They were duly released as the 250 horsepower Lancia Delta S4 Stradale at a price five times that of the Delta HF Turbo. Another update to the road going Delta appeared in 1986. The front bumper was altered and allowed for integrated fog lights. The newer dashboard from the Prisma made its way to all models along with new seats and a turbocharged diesel engine that was no slouch. But all everyone could talk about was the HF four wheel drive. The 2 litre engine taken from the Lancia Thema delivered 164 horsepower and reached 60 miles an hour in 7.4 seconds. That moved it further beyond the Golf GTI, which in any case only had two wheel drive. There was a new kid on the block and he spoke Italian. The next generation rally car was to be the Group S ECV, but both Group S and Group B were banned after the tragic death of Henri Toivonen and Sergio Cresto at the hands of the Delta S4 and two more deaths from a Ford RS200 crash just one race earlier. This meant rallying fell back on Group A rules. Unfortunately, Lancia had just produced the perfect car, the HF four wheel drive with its two litre engine. With some changes, this was entered for the 1987 rallying season. The competition didn't have anything to match it and it went on to win the World Rally Championship crown that year. Not only that, it won the following five years as well, making Lancia's Delta the most successful car in World Rally Championship history. All this rally success helped sell a car that had been on sale for eight years without much of an update, despite the fact that Fiat was about to update the Ritmo with the new Tipo. Lancia kept the Delta selling with the Integrale in 1987 that offered even more power, now 178 horsepower with a 6.2 second 0-60 time. Coupled with the Delta's excellent handling, this made it one of the top hot hatches of the 1980s. Lancia capped off the decade with the Integrale 16 valve with its bonnet bulge that was needed after modifying the engine head. It took the power level to 193 horsepower and 60 arrived in just 5.4 seconds. Rally winds and hot deltas kept cars flying out of Lancia showrooms. 44,000 cars were sold in 1989, for example. A quarter of them were Integrale 16 valves. Sales were so good that Lancia delayed the launch of the second generation car for three years. The Delta might be selling well, but a refresh couldn't hurt, although there was only so much lipstick Lancia could apply to hide the Delta's age. The seats got new fabrics, there was central locking and new exterior colours, although surely the only colour being ordered for such a fast car was red. 1991 bought the even faster Delta Integrale Evoluzione 16 valve with over 200 horsepower. Coach builder Zagato showed off what they could do with the Delta, first with another Cabriolet concept that wasn't produced, and the Lancia Delta Integrale Hyena Zagato that was, available as both a hardtop and a Cabriolet. Underneath, this was a Delta Integrale upgraded to around 300 horsepower. 
due to various factors, the company had to start with a brand new Integrale and then strip it back to make the new car. That cost a pretty penny to produce and only 24 of them were ever built. After selling over half a million first generation cars, Lancia finally launched the next generation Delta in 1993. This time it had been styled by the IDEA Institute, a relatively new styling house that had designed the Fiat Tipo that the new Delta was based upon, as well as the 1989 Lancia Daedra. It was larger than the previous Delta, closer in fact to the old Lancia Beta, and in fact the original idea was to call the car the Beta, but the Delta's rally success changed Lancia's mind. The new lines brought the Delta into the 1990s, somewhat it was styled in the mid-1980s because remember it was supposed to be launched in 1990. Clever styling tricks meant the windscreen and doors were borrowed from the Daedra, so saving some production costs. The dashboard was all new and the cabin used Recaro seats, as had some of the faster first generation models. With a new platform came new safety features such as side impact protection, seat belt pretensioners and a driver's airbag. But Hot Hatch fans wanted to know how it would stack up against the previous generation. The spec sheet looked promising. The top of the range was the Delta HF Turbo LS with 184 horsepower and a 0 to 60 time of 7.1 seconds. Not quite the insane speed of the previous generation and only two wheel drive, but it was a good start. Lancia seemed aware speeds had dropped a little as they kept producing the older generation car and even updated it to the 208 horsepower Evolucione 2. Not to worry, customers were told in 1995 there would be a second generation Delta three door coupe with a 2.3 litre 250 horsepower engine and six speed transmission. Just keep the faith. A mass car maker like Lancia couldn't live purely on hot hatches though, and they were hoping the regular cars in the range would sell in much larger numbers. And there were hopes that the new Delta would expand into new markets, but Lancia exited the UK market in 1995 after years of slow sales. The first generation Delta ended production in 1994, so there were high hopes in 1995 that that three door coupe would be the replacement the Delta deserved. Customers were disappointed. The 2.3 litre 250 horsepower engine failed to materialise and the coupe was no faster than its five door sibling and it still didn't have four wheel drive. A mid-cycle refresh in 1996 with updated engines didn't improve things. Production never got close to the projected 60,000 yearly target, running at around half that. In fact, Lancia as a whole weren't doing that well after the boom time of the 1980s. The 1989 Daedra had sold well, but other cars, not so much. Lancia Faithful had been disappointed by the exit from rallying and there wasn't much excitement in cars like the second generation Delta. It got another small styling refresh in 1998 and the Delta ended production in 1999 after producing just shy of 140,000 cars. There was no money from parent Fiat for a replacement who were having their own financial crisis after producing such hit cars as the Multipler. Lancia projects were postponed and the sporting baton was passed to Alfa Romeo. Instead of performance models, we got the Fedra minivan, which also bombed. But things would go on to improve. Cars like the Ypsilon and Musa did better and soon Lancia was looking to expand its range to something that might be called a Delta. The first thing the public got to see of this was the Gran Turismo Stil Nove concept in 2003. It was further refined into the Delta HPE concept three years later. It was approved for production using a stretched Fiat Bravo platform. This made it a large car, a full 63 centimeters over two feet longer than the original Delta, but that would give enough room for rear passengers and all their luggage. The third generation Lancia Delta launched in 2008 and like the first generation back in 1979, it was pitched as a luxury compact hatchback. It had a high spec level that included leather seats, a navigation system, Blue and Me voice controlled phone and media playback, climate control, lane departure control and automatic parallel parking pitched as magic parking. The rear legroom was generous and rear seats could even be reclined, but the rear boot lip was high and the entry small that made getting luggage into that large boot awkward. It seems Lancia still needed Saab to help them get the ergonomics right. 
Maybe using the Delta name was the wrong move though. All reviewers could talk about were the golden days of the Delta Integrale in the 80s, and the first thing they did was compare the handling and performance with that car, or at least their recollection of that car. The new Delta's handling was set up to be a compromise between luxury and performance. Not a bad idea for a luxury car, but that meant it wallowed through the bends despite an advanced traction control system. And performance just wasn't at the level of the cars from the early 1990s. The fastest engine delivered 187 horsepower with a 7.5 second 0-60 time, and being a diesel it wasn't going to get the pulse racing. It wasn't a patch on the fastest Golf, the R32, that could get to 60 in 5.8 seconds and which had better handling. So customers wanted performance, but Lancia pitched the Delta as the last word in luxury. But even that was a problem. The leather seats might be nice, but the plastics on the dashboard felt cheap, with controls that felt like they were about to break. It was the same complaint motor journalists had made with the original luxurious Delta back in 1979. That original luxury Delta didn't have any competition. The new car was up against the Audi A3 and BMW 1 series, long established players who knew how to make a compact luxury car, and had badge cachet that was in higher demand. Undeterred, Lancia produced the faster 200 horsepower petrol version in 2009. Lancia's marketing people got 200 horses to parade around Amsterdam to show the Lancia Delta had 200 horses under the bonnet. The extra power increased the speed a little, but the level of excitement remained about the same. Fiat partially acquired US company Chrysler and tested the idea of bringing the Delta to North America as a Chrysler at the 2010 Detroit Motor Show. That never happened, but it would come to the UK and Ireland as the Chrysler Delta after Fiat abandoned plans to reintroduce the Lancia name there after the 2009 Great Recession. None of the faster engines made it. Again, the Chrysler Delta was sold on luxury, not performance. And again, it got the same reception. This was a Delta, so why didn't it have mad fast performance? Small refreshes in 2012 and 2014 didn't excite the buying public. It seems the world wasn't ready for a compact luxury car with a cheap plastic dashboard. The Delta ended production in the summer of 2014 after selling just over 110,000 cars, less even than the slow selling second generation car. Lancia had focused the new Delta on luxury with a dash of speed and ended up doing neither very well. The original Delta had focused on luxury with mixed results, but it was always a good handling car, so Lancia lent into that and its sporty image and Lancia's sporty heritage helped sell entry-level models. That was their 1980s recipe for success. The failure of the second and third generation cars hasn't stopped some dreaming of the Delta returning as a true racer. In 2021, GCK Motorsport announced that they were set to revive the Lancia Delta name with the electric Lancia Delta Evo E that might look like an original Delta, but underneath is all new and pure rally car. It started with the last racing event of the 2022 World Rally Championship. For the 2023 season, they snagged the great Sebastian Loeb, but so far the new Delta has failed to make much of an impact. Maybe if it does better, we'll see a road-going Lancia Delta with some sporting chops. In 2021, Lancia's boss told the press a true Delta was on the way in a few years, as an electric car naturally. It was surely needed if the Lancia name was to survive. The brand was now down to just one model. Time will tell if a new Delta comes to fruition and if it'll be what customers want. Just what customers want in 2026 or whenever that car arrives is open to debate. How many beyond the faithful lust for the Integrale from over 30 years ago or even remember it? Is that too small a group of customers to plan a brand new car around? Will Lancia go after the luxury segment again, taking one last swing at pitching Lancia as Italy's answer to Audi, BMW and Mercedes? One thing's for sure, if Lancia get it right like they did with the first generation Delta, they could be on to a winner. These videos take a lot of time and effort to make. If you appreciate them, the best way to support me is through Patreon. 
The donation level is just one pound, one dollar, or one euro, and I believe that's the lowest level I can set. And for that, you get early ad-free access to these videos, usually about a week early. And I also do regular exclusive videos just for patrons. This extra support really helps me devote the time needed to make new videos. So take a look at patreon.com slash big car if you're interested. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.